welcome to our first King's Talk for 2021. My name is Greg Hunter and I am the Deputy Head Co-Curricular at King's. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome the Right Honourable, the Lord Alton of Liverpool, to provide his insights into the House of Lords and answer questions on a wide range of current topics. David Alton is a former Liberal and Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament from 1979 to 1997, where he stood down as MP and was made a life peer as Baron Alton Liverpool by former Prime Minister John Major. He is a crossbencher in the House of Lords and is extremely proactive in his support of human rights issues from Hong Kong and Burma to championing the right to life movement. He's a former teacher, like myself, I suppose, I'm not former, but I'm a teacher, and author of 12 books. Uh, I'm sure we'll gain greatly from his insights tonight. Tonight's talk will take two parts. Firstly, I'll be asking some questions of Lord Alton, and then we'll be taking questions from you, the audience. Please, at any time during this part, type your question into the Q&A function as part of Zoom, and I can ask the question on behalf of you. Or alternatively, if you put your virtual hand up at the appropriate time, I can put you live on the air for you to ask your question yourself of, of David. Now it is time, with great pleasure now, to welcome Lord Alton. Welcome, David. Good evening, Greg. It's a great pleasure to be with you at King. Thank you very much. Look, can we start? Can we start by uh, just sort of tell us about your career and how you got into politics? Well, I think you're right about my career, which was really about education. I was a teacher of any university professor, but my life in politics, I didn't choose a career. I would have been pretty crazy to join a political party that had just a handful of members of parliament and was running at three or four percent in the opinion polls but i felt compelled to get involved in politics so i see it as a calling rather than a career uh, what were the events that drew me into politics well my father had been a desert rat he was one of five brothers who served in the armed forces during the second world war and was killed in the raf uh, my mother was an immigrant her first language was irish not english but had come to england at the end of the war met my dad i was born in the east end of London uh, in, in quite poor circumstances. I mean, I brought up in a house without inside sanitation with a tin bath and the rest, and we were rehoused to a, a council estate on the outskirts of, of London. Um, I wanted to do something about social conditions that I saw as I was growing up. I was lucky enough to win a scholarship into a new grammar school that had just been uh, constructed on the east side of London. And they filled me, the people who ran it, with a sense of trying to make a difference, that you being called, if you were, into some area of public service, whatever it might be, but finding a way of being a, a man or a woman for others, doing something for your community. So those things influenced me a great deal. And then as a 16-year-old, I started to see things going on in the world that I didn't like, including the war in Vietnam, the the occupation of, of Czechoslovakia by the Soviets when they tried to break for freedom from the communists, uh, the war in Biafra, the killing of Martin Luther King, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, uh, troops having to go into Northern Ireland because of the civil rights movement there, trying to get end some of the discrimination against the minority community in Northern Ireland. All these things motivated and interested me. So I joined the Young Liberals. I was elected as chairman of a local branch and when I went to Liverpool as a student and I was the first from either side of my family to go and have any higher education but when I went to Liverpool one of the first things I did was to get involved in some of the student politics there and in my last year as a student living in a neighbourhood where half the houses had no inside sanitation running hot water or bathrooms uh, where some of the streets were still lit by gaslight I thought well something should be done about this and uh, I decided to run to the local council and much to my amazement, I think everybody else's as a 21 year old student, uh, I was elected to the city council. So I spent eight years as a city councillor. I became the chairman of the housing committee, the deputy leader of the council, and I was able to do something about the conditions people were living in. We've created the biggest housing renewal program anywhere in the country in those neighbourhoods. And then there was a by-election uh, in that neighbourhood. And remember, I was a member of a political party that had still only a handful of, of MPs. Uh, if people were writing its obituaries at the time, but um, I, I fought that by-election. It was the first time a Liberal had won a seat in the city of Liverpool since, oh, 1923. Uh, I had a, what, a 64% of the vote, I think, 32% swing, and I became the youngest member of the House of Commons, but also the shortest lived, because I was elected the day 
after the government lost the vote of no confidence. So Margaret Thatcher won the vote of no confidence, the Labour government collapsed, um, a general election was called, and the following day I won a by-election. So I arrived, took my seat the following Tuesday, made my maiden speech two and a half hours later, just in case I never got re-elected, everyone else was packing their bags and had to fight another, another election, the general election, which that, is, that photograph is from. Uh, but I held the Liverpool Edge Hill seat in that uh, general election and then was re-elected in subsequent elections in 1983 and 1992 and decided for reasons we can talk about later if you want. Uh, in 1997, it was time to uh, draw a line and to stand down. Sure, I'll just stop sharing with that picture there. Now, actually, let's let's talk a little about the little bit about the House of Lords and perhaps the structure. How does the system work? You know, does it potentially need reforming? You know, any any of your opinions on that? Yeah, I've always said it should be reformed, and I I, I will come back in a moment to the ways in which it should be reformed. But I believe in a bicameral legislature. Uh, I'm you know the Tony Benn view of life used to be that we should just have a unicameral legislature, just one house. Uh, I actually think the checks and balances of the two houses are fantastic. Um, and you, you can't get legislation through until both houses have approved it. But in the end, the House of Commons, and essentially I still remain a House of Commons man, the House of Commons is supreme yeah. if on the third time of asking, since the 1911 Parliament Act, on the third time of asking in ping pong between the two houses, then the House of Commons will get its way. This is very close to my heart at the moment because only this week, an amendment I moved in the House of Lords, which got a majority of 126 on the issue of genocide, went down to the House of Commons and we brought the, the government within 11 votes of a defeat. Uh, but that amendment now comes back to the Lords uh, in two weeks time and we will send it back to the Commons with some modifications having listened to the debate. And in the end, we'll, I hope we'll get some kind of agreement. But I, so I believe in, a, in, in two houses. What I don't think is acceptable is having a House of Lords that seems to grow and grow and grow in size. Um, I don't think it should be for life. I think it, in some ways there should be some kind of way of, of people really knowing when it's, <laughs> they've made their contribution and it's time to move on. And one way you could do that is the way in which the groups themselves, the three political parties, and the cross benches where the independents who are non-aligned members in the house should be able to choose from amongst themselves to bring down the size, the number in, in the house. That's what happened with the hereditary peers. Yeah. There, there were hundreds of hereditary peers. They were reduced to under a hundred. There are about, I think 98 in the house now, and they were chosen from within their own ranks. So you create a sort of college system, if you will. Yeah, it, it's funny, just sticking on that whole point of the two houses, you know, being a, a proud Australian that I am, you know, in Australia, you're probably aware of their political system. They've got a lower house and upper house, and it's very similar. Laws only get passed if it goes through both houses. Um, but the upper house is also elected as when you vote in the elections in Australia, which is compulsory, and you get a fine if you don't vote as a, as a citizen. Um, the the um, It's... it's actually filled on proportional representation, the upper house. What's your thoughts on even that sort of reform or is that something that's not appropriate? No, I've thought a lot about this and I'm not, of course I'm not as completely opposed to the idea of having, as it were, an elected upper house, maybe like a, a Senate. But the only difficulty about this is that if you have two elected chambers, mm. then which of them is going to be supreme? Mm. Uh, at the moment, it's the House of Commons, uh, no contest. But if I was actually elected with my own mandate from electors in, con in a constituency, then I wouldn't be so willing to accept the decision of the House of Commons. I would say, well, we're elected too. So I think you build into the system some instability, uh, which I'm not in favour of. Uh, what does the House of Lords bring to the table? It brings experience, it brings expertise, and I... <laughs> And it doesn't bring a great deal of ambition. I mean, most of us who are members have done what we were going to do. Um, we bring our gifts to the table. Uh, we don't get a salary for that. You get a small allowance for the days that you, you're able to attend and you've got to meet your own overheads. Uh, you don't have staff. You don't have research assistants. I don't even have a secretary. So I'm a one man band. But I, you know, I relish that. Uh, I, I know that I bring, a, I bring something to the table that others don't. I'm, I'm told I'm only one of two 
peers in the entire house who actually live here in Lancashire in the northwest of England. Now, I, I disapprove of that. I think too many people live, as it were, in the London borough of Richmond or, yeah. or within a small radius of, of Westminster. That, that I don't like because I think Parliament has become dislocated and alienated. And maybe one of the reasons why in the referendum there was so much antagonism towards the political classes, it was because they look like elites who don't have anything whatsoever to do with people living in Lancashire towns like Blackburn or Burnley, uh, mm -hmm. Bury. Um, you, you know, you, you come to places here like Cliverow or down to Preston. And it's a different world from Twickenham or, or Richmond upon Thames. Yeah, I, I agree. You're going to be nostalgic knowing those all those towns very well. You're going to be very nostalgic. Um, so why, you know, you, 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 you served as a Liberal Democrat and uh, Liberal peer. Why are you a crossbencher? Well, in the 1990s, I had a, a issue of principle on, on which I had a profound disagreement with what had become the Liberal Democrats. Now, remember, I told you I joined the Liberal Party, it was Mr. Gladstone's party, it was the party of William Beveridge, it was the party of John Maynard Keynes, uh, with, with an illustrious history. I mean, Winston Churchill, of course, was a Liberal at one point and became a Conservative later. So it had produced extraordinary people. Um, and I looked at its traditions and the things that it stood for. And I didn't like the idea of, of state socialism. And I wasn't very attracted to the idea of a political party that appeared to only look after a certain segment of society. Um, that isn't to say that I can't see the, the, the good things inside both the Labour Party and Conservative Party. I can. I like the one nation tradition inside conservatism and I like the, a lot to do with the social democratic tradition inside the Labour Party. But the old Liberal Party, particularly under the days of Joe Grimmond's leadership, he was a man I admired enormously. Uh, he was the reason I felt attracted into the Liberal Party more than any other reason, I suppose, was because I thought it was a party of principle and conscience. Now, I disagreed with colleagues in the party over something that matters a lot to me. It may not matter to people who are tuned into our, our interview this evening, but since 1967, there have been over nine million abortions in Britain. There's one every three minutes in the United Kingdom, one every three minutes, 600 every day, this was never intended, but incidentally, by the movers of the 1967 Abortion Act. I think it's the taking of a new life. So for me, this is a profoundly important issue. Now, if you don't share that view, if you just say, well, it's a matter of choice, you'd come to a different conclusion. But if you think this is real life, new life, uh, and you're then told this is no longer an issue of conscience, it's going to be a party policy, what do you do? Uh, and I fought against it becoming a party policy. Uh, I lost. Um, and it wasn't taking my bat and ball away. I'd said very clearly, I will never ever be able to defend this as a party policy. So I didn't join another party, but I said I was going to stand down at the election, which is what I then did in 1997. Some of the other policies that the Liberal Democrats had started to adopt didn't suit me either. Their opposition of their education spokesman to church schools, uh, the support for euthanasia, the legalization of drugs and so on. These are not things that are close to my heart <laughs> and things I didn't agree with. Um, I'm perfectly happy to argue about those things, but I, I was never going to be prepared to adopt any of them as, uh, as matters of party policy. And I think that this was a big error. I'd been the Liberal Party chief whip and I would never have asked people to support things that they couldn't square with their own conscience. And I felt that's the direction the party had gone in. And incidentally, I think at the last general election, getting so involved in fringe issues around mm. identity politics and so on, are they surprised that people on the streets of Liverpool did not go out and vote for them? If they're not, then they'd learnt nothing. Um, and it breaks my heart to see that. I would have, you know, I'd like them to return to the old Liberal Party, big L liberal values. Um, so I stood down and I'd been offered a chair at one of the universities in Liverpool and I thought, I'll go and write some more books and, and spend some time you know, with my kids growing up and doing that kind of thing. Uh, and much to my surprise, um, like a prisoner trying to get out of the, the jail, uh, I was given a, a life sentence for bad behaviour. John Major, the Conservative uh, leader, Prime Minister, contacted me and said, would I take a seat if I was offered one? And I said, well, I'm not about to join the Conservative Party. Um, and he said, we don't expect you to. You'll sit wherever you choose to sit. And I couldn't get over it, to be honest. I was 
he, I got to know him quite well because I was the Northern Ireland spokesman for some years and we worked together in the early days of the Northern Ireland peace process. We'd both been whips together in Parliament as well. So I guess he knew quite enough to, to know whether I'd met, have a contribution to make or not. So I took him at his word. My two sponsors was a former Speaker of the House of Commons, uh, he'd become Lord Weverall, Jack Weverall, and Lord Hilton, who was Asquith's grandson, um, hereditary peer, still a member of the House in his, in his 80s, great man. Um, and they were my two sponsors. I took my seat and that was in 1997. So I didn't escape. And, and to this day, I continue to bring whatever gifts I've got to the table. It's a great honour and a privilege, uh, enormous privilege, really. Yeah, it, 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 I'm, sure, I'm sure it is, and you know, very proud of what you, you know, you must be very proud of what you've done. And so, to, so on the Liberal Democrats, you know, because they have taken a bit of a, I suppose, a battering at the at the last general election, etc. Do, do they have a future? How can they move forward at the moment? Well, political parties and movements can can have a future, but they have to learn something from the past. And I think they've got to realise why, why they have been, been relegated to the margins. And they'll find it harder now with uh, Keir Starmer, I think, regaining some of the centre-left ground that would have been lo lost to Jeremy Corbyn. So, I, you know, they, they ought to have done far better at the last election. Look, I think back to the 1980s when, with my colleagues, I helped to construct the Liberal SDP alliance, where we brought the Social Democrats and the old Liberal Party in a, a, a coalition, an alliance. We won 25% of the British vote in that, in the 1983 election. An extraordinary outcome, and because without proportional representation, of course, the number of actual parliamentary seats was still small, but it was an amazing outcome. And I, I think that the Liberal Party that had touched the raw nerve with people, I think what it stood for, um, the qualities that it stood for, its values, uh, struck a nerve. I don't think that people know what the Liberal Democrats stand for any longer, and they're going to have to sort that out first and foremost, yeah. uh, and see what common cause they can make with others. Um, but it's going to be a real hard slog for them. You can't just go on saying, regardless of the outcome of a referendum, for instance, that we're going to reverse that, that decision, I mean, which was, again, another plank at the last election. Now, I happen to be a Remainer myself, but I don't think you can ignore the outcome of a, if you're going to call a referendum, which the Liberal Democrats have been in favour of calling, <laughs> then to say when it, you don't get the result that you wanted, well, we're going to ignore it anyway. And then when there's a general election and people vote for a prime minister who says that he's going to make Brexit mean what he said it would mean, and you still say, well, we're not going to abide by it, I don't think that people will trust you because they'll say, well, you, you've broken your word. And of course, trust in politics matters. And then you wheel back to the coalition that the uh, Liberal Democrats were in and one of the things that they had promised for instance was that there would be um, tuition fees which would not be raised and within days they did exactly the opposite so I think that there's a lot of work to be done to regain trust it's, but it's not impossible we did it back in my early days through community politics by making ourselves relevant on the ground working hard in neighborhoods showing people what we were made of and I think in the end people decided they'd give us a try uh, I don't think that, in other words, I don't think there's a shortcut for them. Yeah. What's the, um, you, you've obviously had a very long and distinguished career in, in politics, uh, whether it be, you know, in the House of Lords, but also obviously as an MP. What's your proudest achievement or achievements, do you think, in your career? Uh, I think G.K. Chesterton once said pride uh, doesn't go before the fall, pride is the fall. So I was going to be a bit careful about yeah. being too proud. Uh, Ian Forster, in a book called uh, Two Cheers for Democracy, said yeah. that only love the beloved republic deserve three cheers. He said, sometimes the cranky, idiosyncratic, bloody-minded member of parliament who gets some minor injustice put right, <laughs> he is the justification of our democratic system. And I guess that, in a sense, you know, getting some minor injustice put right, taking on a cause and doing something about it, you know, I'm frankly these days I'm less interested in left and right, more interested as it were in right and wrong. And when I look at politicians, yeah. the first thing I wanna know is what's their cause? Why are they in this? And if they don't have a cause, if there's nothing that they actually feel strongly about, they've got no principles, you know, finger in the wind, which way, are the princi which way is the wind blowing? Well, these are my principles. If you don't like them, I'll change them according to what the wind is saying, what the opinion polls or anything else. I, I honestly, I think 
taking on a cause, standing for something you care about and trying to make a difference, what more could you want than that? But so if you ask me what gave me the opportunity to do those things, I think that would, of course, be the 1979 by-election. Yeah. Which, I mean, in, uh, you, if someone said to me, oh, how do you go into politics? You wouldn't do it the way I did it. I mean, it's just crazy. But the dice kept falling in ways that nobody anticipated or expected. I mean, look, they hadn't, a Liberal hadn't fought that seat since 1951. Uh, they let me lose because there were no votes to lose. There wasn't a single party member in the constituency. Uh, and when I won my council seat there, uh, I was the first, but we, by, by three years later, we'd won every single council seat in that constituency. Uh, and if you look, if you look back at the story of, that I've just described, if there's any young person in the audience tonight thinking about politics, don't think about being things. Don't wonder how you can climb the ladder to become the great panjandrum. Think about doing things. What are you going to do for the people, for your country, your community? And then, yes, of course, you'll choose a party. And there's no party is the communion of saints. <laughs> They've all got their blemishes, faults, and for, and you know. But choose the one you think is the one where you will feel most comfortable. Don't think you're always going to go with the party, whatever it says. What W.S. Gilbert, I think those lovely lines from Gilbert and Sullivan, they always vote at their party's call and never ever think for themselves at all. And I would urge particularly your, your students to think for themselves and to stand for things that matter. And in the end, you know, that's how you'll be remembered. Look, one of my great heroes, who was a Conservative member of Parliament as it happened, was a man called William Wilberforce. He was 40 years in the House of Commons. He never once held ministerial office. He was never the leader of the Conservative Party. What did he do? He realized that the greatest evil of the day was the belief that you could own another human being as a slave merely because of the color of their skin. And he said, it's not my right to choose to do that or anybody else's. And he got together with a a lad, he was only a lad who had just dropped out of Cambridge University. Uh, he sat by the River Cam and he felt that he was being called quite, he'd had a sort of religious experience. He felt he was being called to do something about the slave trade. So Thomas Clarkson, a young man, and William Wilberforce, the youngest member of the House of Commons, they got together with some ladies called the Quaker Ladies in London. And they founded a committee. And here's a lesson. <laughs> I've got a here in my study, I've got a poster that says, God so loved the world, he did not send a committee. But you can't go into politics if you're not prepared to serve on committees and to work with others and accommodate difference and work around them. Um, and you won't always get your own way. That's the nature of things. They recruited a lawyer called Granville Sharp, who took a, a case of a young man who was, had been, a, been brought to Britain as a slave. He was found on the street. He'd been beaten up by his owner and left there. Granville Sharp took that case to court and Mr. Justice Mansfield found in favor of the slave and in favor of the, uh, and against the, uh, the man who was reclaiming the ownership of, of, of the youngster who, who'd been abandoned and said, this is against the law within these islands. It may not be within our empire, but it is within these islands. It was a hugely important legal case. And then they started a big campaign around the country and people started to boycott sugar from the plantations where these poor folk were working. Wilberforce set up a select committee inquiry at Westminster. One of the people who came and gave evidence was a Liverpool sea captain who had literally been on ships where they threw overboard slaves who were sick or disabled, dying, who wouldn't bring a price once they'd arrived in the plantations. Who was the sea captain? a man called John Newton. And every time you sing, as you no doubt do in your school, Amazing Grace, he was the man who wrote it. He changed his mind. He said, I've got to do something about the things I have been involved in. So he came and helped Wilberforce and, a, and an escaped slave called Aweda Equiano came and helped. He was nearly lynched, by the way, in Liverpool, which where people had been making their money on the back of the slave trade in 1807. 17 million pounds passed hands uh, in the slave trade in Liverpool that year. It's, I mean, the sort of wealth of the city of London today. And the triangle between Liverpool, Bristol, and West Africa, and then Virginia, and then back again with raw materials being brought to England, with the ships going out, with 
finished products being dumped into the markets in Africa and then the slaves being taken on the final bit of the triangle out to the Caribbean and, and to the plantations. Uh, and it's an extraordinary story. And of course, it's playing itself out to this day. I mean, you think about Black Lives Matter, you think about some of the events we've seen, some of them horrendous events, incidentally. I think when you see people who are close allies of the Ku Klux Klan, um, people storming Capitol Hill and trying to subvert a democracy, some of these are, are, are descendants of the very people who defended the slave trade in those days. That was, what, after all, what the Civil War was all about. And hearing President Biden talking yesterday about the uncivil war today should have struck a chord with people if they think about that kind of story. So I would say to people, if you're thinking about going into politics, don't think about being things. You're not going to be prime minister in five minutes. And if you are, well, you probably climb up the ladder. Oh, you know what? You'll probably fall off it again very quickly, but you might be able to do something. Wilberforce, when he was on his deathbed, the message was brought to him that the House of Commons had just finally enacted the laws banning slave, not slavery, not just uh, within the United Kingdom, but throughout the whole of our possessions and the Royal Navy would be deployed in order to stop the ships from being able to go on trading other human beings. Something this country should be enormously proud of. So when people start pulling down monuments and they start going on about the, the bad things that people undoubtedly did, remember the good things that were done too. And that's the virtues of a democracy like this. Yeah, thank you. Um, before we'll take, in just in a moment, we'll take some uh, questions from the floor. So please, uh, uh, from the audience, so please either type them in or put your virtual hand up and I, I can put you on to, to, to ask your question directly of Lord Alton. But before we do that, I saw this on the internet just before we started, and this this lady is an absolute inspiration. I can't believe you you, you met her. Um, can I can I can I just share this and so just get your thoughts on on this particular uh, moment you had? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that, of course it's Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I chaired a meeting uh, during a visit that that she made to the Palace of Westminster, and it where that picture is taken actually just off of. Westminster Hall, which is incidentally where Thomas More and Edmund Campion and others uh, who uh, <laughs> would be heroes of mine um, were tried and taken to their to their death. And I, in fact, I I took her into Westminster Hall, and I showed her where Thomas More had stood trial. And before I knew it, she was literally on her knees kissing the ground. Uh, I walked through there every day of my life. So I was pretty pretty taken aback at that moment, and it it it, it, it struck me in my heart. But we, at the end of the meeting, where she was dealt brilliantly, I thought with 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 questions from members of parliament and the media, I said to her, "You know, it's a it's a tough battle. This so 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 often you you face defeat." And she said to me. You are not called upon to be successful. You are called upon to be faithful. So it's one of those things that uh, you think, yes, Mother Teresa, um, uh, I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, oh, she is an absolutely inspirational um, person, really and truly. Well, I went out to Calcutta on, on a couple of occasions as well. I've seen the work that the sisters have done there. Of course, Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, whom I met and got to know a little bit, but he, totally changed his mind about religion and a lot of other things as a result of meeting Mother Teresa. Uh, and he, I, his story, uh, she told him quite literally, he wrote a little book about it. Um, she told him, go and do something beautiful for God. So he wrote a book called Something Beautiful for God. And it's the effect that she had on him. And if, you know, she said, if you asked me to, I wouldn't pick up one of these dying people. Uh, and I saw some of the people that she was caring for in Calcutta, I wouldn't pick them up for a thousand dollars. She said, but I do it for the love of God. And I saw her, what her sisters did in Liverpool. They, they have a hostel in, in Liverpool. They were the ones who were going out on the street to rescue women with psychiatric problems, people who are homeless, providing meals for people. I mean, this, there's real dedication, extraordinary love and dedication there. So. You know, we can talk a lot, but in the end, sometimes you have to recognize that it's through te people's deeds that you can actually learn most most about them and most about what how you should live your own life. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Can I, um, I I'm going, we're going to start the questions from, from, from the audience. And in fact, we've got uh, Stephen's got his hand up. So I'm going to allow Stephen to talk. 
Uh, Stephen, if you just unmute yourself and, and, and ask Lord Alton a question. Good evening, Lord Alton. My name is Stephen Bianco. I was at King's uh, in the 1950s and early 60s and have lived in Toronto for the last 40 odd years. Um, been watching, of course, as many people have been glued to the television the last uh, number of weeks, watching what's going on south of the border here. I live in Toronto, as I say. And I just wonder whether you have any suggestions or advice that you might be prepared to give to uh, the new President Biden. Well, I thought that his uh, address to the nation yesterday struck a pretty good contrast with some of the more vituperative and confrontational things that President Trump had said in his inauguration address uh, four years earlier. I don't think that everything that um, Donald Trump did was wrong. I think there are things in, in, that we can learn from during the course of his presidency. Uh, and after all, he has he achieved an extraordinary result in the election, which showed that the United States was deeply divided. And I think that the reason for that, what we can learn from this experience is that, again, I mentioned it in my remarks earlier on, that there is deep alienation uh, towards the political classes. And I guess I would have to count myself as being part of the political classes. So we've got to learn from that and re-engage. And I felt that Joe Biden was trying to do that yesterday in what he had to say. I also feel incidentally that the new um, leader in the, in the Senate was trying to do that and also the Republican leaders in the Senate were trying to do that. So I, having, I think having been caught up in the horrors both of the pandemic but also the assault on, on Congress uh, two weeks ago, I think that there is a moment here where, where the United States is taking stock of itself and its institutions and saying that we have got to rebuild and we've got to do it pretty fast because otherwise there will be a total loss of confidence. Initially, one might have worried that people in Beijing or in, in the Kremlin would be watching these events and smirking with glee to see uh, such chaos near anarchy in Washington, DC. However, I, I take a slightly different view from that. I think what it's demonstrated is the resilience of American institutions and that however much people wanted to try and overturn an election result. Ultimately, the law ensured that the results were recognized, that they were honored. Uh, incidentally, thanks to, in many cases, uh, election returning officers who were Republican in many of those states and districts which were contested. So I, I think all that is a good thing in, in terms of where America goes from here, but more bipartisanship, a willingness to go back to listening to the other side. I think that Joe Biden would be foolish to introduce um, culturally divisive legislation. I mentioned my own views about abortion a bit earlier on. It can be a very divisive issue when it's turned into a sort of uh, a dog whistle where um, people from the other side are literally taunted uh, around this issue. And I think to, to start in trying to introduce new legislation on that, for instance, would be a big error on Joe Biden's part. So I think everything he does now should really concentrate on, on the immediate pandemic, the crisis, and the rebuilding of institutions and the reuniting of the political world in Washington. Thank you. Thank, thanks, thanks for your question, Stephen. I, I will come to the hands just in a moment. There, there are a couple more hands up. Um, I just want to, an early question asked from Adam. Um, you know, because you mentioned about the size of the, the, the House of Lords, you know, how would you bring that size down? Um, and, you know, would you potentially uh, uh, start to remove some of the hereditary peers? I, first of all, I would stop the by-elections that we have. For her, when a hereditary peer dies, then they have a, a, a by-election within the group of, of, that they're a member of. So I think there are three hereditary peers on the Labour benches. So if one dies, the other two get to vote who the next person in will be. This is ridiculous. Um, and there is a private member's bill before the House of Lords at the moment to stop that. So that would mean that as people themselves die, they would not then be replaced. And that seems a very natural way of dealing with this for me. But some of the hereditary peers make an extraordinary contribution. They work incredibly hard. And you know, they bring something special in terms of expertise, particularly about rural affairs and the countryside, uh, that you don't get from uh, those of us who come from more urban city backgrounds and, uh, and who 
who really don't understand the, 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 the things that make the countryside work in, in the same way. So I, I'd be sorry to lose all, all that expertise. And I think that if some of them were to uh, become life peers, that would be a way of reconciling these things. Frankly, for those who sit on the cross benches where, where I sit, some of them would be elected as life cross bench peers if they stood for election because of the expertise that they bring to the table. And I'm giving you the clue there to the way I would reduce the size. I would say, first of all, by law, the House of Lords will never be bigger than the House of Commons in total numbers. Um, I think that when an election takes place, whoever, whichever party wins has a right to be the larger party in the House of Lords. So you have to moderate that by the removal of some members from the party that lost the election. They need to choose that from within their num own numbers. So if there are 80 of you, as there are 80 or 90 Liberal Democrats, if you only poll 10% of, of the vote or less, then you, you, you're not entitled to more than about 10% of the seats in, in the House of Lords. So they would have to choose from within their number. And I, I think all of us, um, regardless of how many years we've been in the House, should be willing to subject ourselves to real peer, peer group <laughs> review. Uh, <laughs> interesting phrase in these circumstances. But that would be a, a good way, I think, of, of reducing the size of the house and keeping it fresh as well. It would allow for new blood to come in. Um, I mean, if you ossify and if you you simply um, become sclerotic, uh, that there's no new new blood. I don't think that's very healthy either. So there's and and you heard what I said earlier on about regional representation. I mean, the north of England feels very alienated. That's why the red wall seats fell, why so many were won by Boris Johnson at the general election. And he did come up with an interesting idea after the election that Parliament should be moved to, uh, or at least the House of Lords anyway, to sit in, in York. Now, I think there are arguments for and against this. What I do think you could do is have a, a grand committee of members of the House of Lords that would sit in York, for instance, from time to time, or in Lancaster from time to time, so we don't have another War of the Roses, <laughs> in order to consider uh, northern issues, which then can be fed back into the system. Um, so a bit more devolution would be a good idea, and maybe the House of Lords is one way of doing that. Interesting and, and uh, you know, really thought-provoking ideas there. Um, I'm going to now, uh, uh, we've got another hand up here, it's uh, Ned Richards, one of our current uh, six A's, upper six pupils. Ned, Good, please, you're on there. Please speak, ask your question of Lord Alton. Thank you. Um, Lord Alton, I, I heard you mention that um, at a previous election, the SDP uh, Liberal Alliance uh, achieved 25% of the vote, but only a handful of seats. So I wondered if you thought that um, the first past the post electoral system was outdated and what system you thought uh, ought to replace it instead? Good question, Ned. I. I've puzzled over this all my life. I, yeah, man and boy, I've supported electoral reform. But let me be clear about this. I value the constituency system where you as an individual who has been elected by people, you're accountable to people, not to a political party. So I would never vote for what's called the party list system, <laughs> which operates in a number of countries where the only people that you have to satisfy are members of your party to get on high on that list. And if they get 20% of the vote, then 20% of the list gets elected. So I don't like that. The alternative vote system was, was put to the vote. Um, I thought it was a big error on the, on the part of my former party colleagues to call a referendum on the alternative vote system when Nick Clegg himself had already said, and I quote his exact words, he said, well, it's a very miserable little com compromise. If you're going to change the system, you don't want a miserable compromise. What was it a compromise from? It was from the idea of the single transferable vote in multi-member seats. That's the system I would like to see operate. It's the one they have in the Republic of Ireland. It's one we've used in Northern Ireland from time to time. So what, not, not for Westminster elections, but we've used it in other, in, 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 uh, in the elections for the assembly there, for instance, and in what were the European elections. If you took a city like Liverpool, which traditionally sends back about six MPs, it would still send back six MPs, but it would send them as a one constituency rather than six. And the beauty of that would be that if you got 50% of the vote, you'd get three of the seats. At the moment, 
the Labour Party get all of the seats, and yet they don't get more than about 60% of the vote in the city. And so some people, conservatives living in a city like that, haven't had a conservative MP in that city since 1983. Um, they haven't had a city councillor there in almost as long, and yet there's probably about 20% of the city actually votes conservative. And I don't think that's very healthy because you turn it into a, like a one party state. So the single transferable vote has that virtue, that it may, means that you get a more representative system. It would also mean that if you were putting up six candidates from your party, well, they couldn't all be white and middle class. You'd have to put up a more representative group of people. So I think we'd see more women on the list, uh, but not because you've got a quota system, because I think you, you, you would know yourselves that if you didn't put a representative group, no one will take you seriously. It would be easier, I think, for minorities uh, to secure a place amongst the six. Um, so that's how the multi-member system would work with the single transferable vote. It would be my preference. I would not trade first past the post with our present constituency system for most forms of proportional representation. So let, let me be perfectly honest about it. I think that they would be worse than what we have now, even though I've seen its distorting effects in things like that 1983 election, Adam, that I, the, uh, rather, that uh, we, we referred to earlier on. Thank, thanks for your question, Ned. Thank you. Um, well, uh, there is another, another hand up which we'll come back to, come to in a moment. Another uh, attendee, quite a lot of questions being typed in. Thank you very much. Keep, keep them coming. Um, uh, I hope we can get to as many as we can. Why do you think we've seen, you sort of I think touched on some aspects of this, why do you think we've seen such a rise in populism with Brexit and Trump? You know, why, what's been the catalyst for that? Uh, well, Greg, I, I think you've got to be careful here, but I, is it wrong to seek popularity? Of course not. In an election, that's exactly what you do. You're trying to demonstrate to people that the things you stand for, your beliefs, your track record, uh, should make you the most popular candidate. You want people to vote for you. So I'm not in favour of political parties trying to be as unpopular as they can. However, I fought three general elections on a, on a ticket saying that I was going to increase their taxes. Now, most people would say, you what? You'd never get elected. And I said, no, no, no. I argued for a hypothecated tax. I told my constituents, if I get elected and if I'm in a position to do anything about it, I would work for an increase of a penny in the pound on your taxes. And what would it pay for? For education. And my constituents elected me and they increased my majorities <laughs> so I, they, I couldn't have put them off entirely but but populism can degenerate into something else it's a sort of pujardism where you where you appeal to the lowest common denominator in people and people used to say to me oh if only you change your mind about the death penalty i'd vote for you and i would say well i'm sorry i'm not i don't believe in capital punishment and i've got good reasons and i'd explain to them what they are I said, but if, if that's the price, then you better vote for one of the other candidates. Frequently, people would say to me after, I did vote for you, by the way, I still don't agree with you. But it's better to be honest and straightforward with people. I mean, obviously, many of my constituents wouldn't have shared my view about abortion. But it didn't stop them in the end still sending me back, because at least they knew I st stood for something. And that, that I cared about it, something enough to be willing to risk my own political life by standing up for something that mattered. Um, and I, I think that's, that's good popularity. That's the right kind of popularity based on a relationship with your constituents. And it's based on standing for something that they can admire and believe in. Um, mm -hmm. Not that you're some kind of alabaster saint. None of us in politics are. And if that's what you're looking for, then, you know, you'll end up being disappointed. I mean, I think heroes and heroines uh, inevitably disappoint you in the end. You, you, if you, if if you think you're looking for perfection. Uh, none of us survived the perfection test. Um, but I've watched aggressive opportunism. I don't like the way that um, President Trump played into some of those arguments. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, and instead of reaching out to people, especially in the aftermath of you know, killings by police officers, instead of reaching out to a community that felt in incredibly vulnerable and angry as well, I think it was a huge error to play the kind of cards that he played. Um, so 
this is I, and I, it's not just there. I mean, you look at what Putin has done in Russia. You look what Erdogan is doing in Turkey, and perhaps worst of all, you have someone like President Xi Jinping, uh, who doesn't need to be a populist because he's a dictator. Mm. And you see the kind of imposition uh, of the Chinese Communist Party ideology on Uyghurs. I've been speaking about it in the House this week. I made the point that uh, a million people incarcerated in Xinjiang, a region I visited in, in the west of China and Tibet, a million people used as forced labor, producing cheap textiles that are then sold on by Primark, Next and, and, and big retailers. Uh, and, and we just go along with this. Twen I, I made the point that 13 tons of human hair shaved off of the heads of Uyghur slave labor had been exported for you know, fashion purposes to be turned into wigs and so on around the world. I mean, this is, I don't need to remind you what memories this conjures up of what we thought would never happen again, but it is happening again. And I think that populism plays into a politics that isn't prepared to then stand up and say, we will not tolerate this. And no, it may, it may mean that economically it disadvantages us. I mean, your countrymen, Greg, in Australia uh, are to be admired for the stand that they have taken about the things that they have seen happening in Trump, Communist Party China, whereas many nations around the world have remained silent about these things um, because of the, the money that's poured into their countries, because of the projects that have been developed by, by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Australia wanted an independent inquiry into Wuhan and the origins of COVID, the coronavirus. As a result of that, what did the Chinese Communist Party do? They said, we're going to ban all Australian wine from coming into our country. We're going to help wreck their economy. Now, that tells you all you need to know. So don't let's get too uptight about populism. Let's get far more uptight about dictatorship and, uh, and countries, particularly China, but to some extent Russia as well, who would impose on us their hegemony if they get half the chance. And if we are so stupid that we go along with this with our, when, we, when our eyes are wide open, we still have a chance to do something about it rather than buying their technology, allowing Huawei access to all, all of uh, our security systems, um, ra rather than allowing them to own large chunks of our nuclear industry, uh, rather than setting up Confucius in institutes inside all of our, our universities and centers of higher education. I mean, let's be wise about this. Uh, could you imagine Margaret Thatcher doing any of those things in the context of the former Soviet Union? That's the direct parallel. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I um, can I just, I've, I've got somebody who's been very patient, uh, Charlie sure. Dean, Charles, uh, current pupil at King's. Charles, you, you, you please ask your question of Lord Olson. Unmute yourself and ask. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Lord Alton. Uh, my Hello, name is uh, I'm Michelle in King, so I'm a first year student. And uh, what I'd like to know is uh, if you believe the British government is going to assist um, European students uh, who want to study in England uh, because of Brexit. Uh, and now I'm not really asking this question for myself, I'm asking it for my friend because I'm half Greek. and. Uh, children who were originally planning to go to uh, the UK to study uh, now have uh, some difficulties because of Brexit. Well, I must, I must admit, Charles, this is one of the things that I, I feel very sad about in, as a result of our decision to leave the European Union. Look, I'm a bit of a reluctant Remainer. That I, the first political meeting I ever went to while I was at school, um, was about the common market. I joined the only party that actually believed in joining the common market. And I think the principle of the common market is a good one. I think the principles of the founding fathers of what became uh, the European community, now the European Union, you look back at people like Adenauer, who, who'd been put in jail by the Nazis in, in Germany, would go on to become its chancellor. You think of de, de Gasperi in, in, in Italy, who went through Italian jails under the fascists. You think of the ideas of people like Jacques Maritain and Mounier in, in France, 
you put those things together and what they wanted to do was to create a community where reconciliation would be promoted, um, where in the aftermath of two world wars, primarily originating in Europe and fought out on European soil, that we would not allow those things to happen again. And the good things that, were, that came out of all of that were for me, projects like the Erasmus project and the ability of students to be able to travel to one another's countries uh, and learn about each other's countries. I think that's a, a fantastic thing to be able to do and prove those friendships. Incidentally, I think you, you can heal history and you can, you, you can move forward into the future with much more certainty. And I think that whatever happens now in terms of our own future relationships with, the, with continental Europe, that we should not allow uh, those relationships, especially amongst young people, to be dissipated. So I would myself uh, plead with, with the UK government to, to retain the opportunities of people studying in one another's countries uh, between, the, between our, ourselves and, and the European landmass. Um, this is a question that be, is being raised, incidentally, in both houses of Parliament, and I, I haven't given up on this yet. I'm, I'm rather hoping that you know, the government will listen to this. I know that there's a lot of sympathy amongst, incidentally, a number of Conservative members of Parliament um, who obviously have more influence on the government than, uh, than, than others do. Um, my own anxiety about the European Union, the re reason I, I said I, I felt reluctant to, but did vote remain, was because I'd seen it grow into something that those founding fathers had never intended. Um, I think that the failure of the European Union to listen to David Cameron, for instance, when he went to plead for an easing of, of freedom of movement um, for work purposes uh, and for settlement purposes, they, they should have been more alive to the arguments he was putting. And I think that that played into the hands of people who simply wanted the UK to, to leave the European Union. So I think there was a lack of openness and sensitivity inside the the, the Brussels infrastructure, the European Union infrastructure, in addressing some of the genuine concerns that had arisen about the nature uh, of the, the, the super state. The, and of course, that was, I think, the clinching argument in the end, the fear that this was morphing into a United States of Europe. Uh, I didn't vote for the Lisbon Treaty because I felt it was something that should have been then put to the UK electorate that we should have argued we should have gone and argued more forcefully uh, about the virtues of what had been achieved thus far and establish how much people were prepared to accept in terms of further integration i mean i don't didn't want a, a common currency i didn't want us to become a euro a european super state i still don't want that and i think that many other people living in continental europe share that view uh, and the tragedy is now we've ended up with uh, the destruction of that special relationship we had. The challenge for your generation is what you can rebuild out of this, this mess, because it has become a mess. Uh, I was pleased to hear Boris Johnson say, uh, but we may have left uh, the European Union, but that doesn't mean to say that we're going to leave um, our European friends and neighbours and that we're going to continue our relationship. I mean, that's going to become more than rhetoric. And I do think that it will be things like student relationships the building of, of academic uh, relationships between academic institutions in the UK and, and on the continent. I think it will be those things that will perhaps spawn whatever comes out in the future in new relationships. And maybe it will be the return to the principles of the common market. If the referendum had been about, would you like to return to the principles of the common market? Would you like to be in the common market? The, it would have been overwhelmingly yes. Um, and I, I, I think that I'm not a big fan of referenda. Um, I think it becomes a, a binary argument, yes or no, black or white, take it or leave it, when there were arguments to be addressed on both sides and you, you couldn't reflect that in a referendum. Uh, you couldn't reflect issues like the Erasmus programme or the value of student education. Uh, and I think we should learn that lesson as we now think about the United Kingdom and whether we're now gonna have more referenda in Scotland, for instance, about whether Scotland remains within the United Kingdom. I think it'd be a tragedy for the UK uh, if we were to have independence in Scotland and the separation of Scotland and England. I, I think it would be a tragedy for us. So 
you know, your your generation have got to do some new thinking. And as I say, the very first meeting I went to uh, as a schoolboy was about the common market. Um, and I'm sorry where we've reached now, but it doesn't mean to say that you can't do rather better in the future. Thank, thanks, Dave. Uh, thank you for your question. Okay, so um, we, we, we're getting close to the end of our time, and I, I apologise uh, for anybody that has um, asked questions in the in the in the typed questions that uh, haven't been asked yet. Um, one I'm interested in, in in asking here that that's come through: How do you find, or did you find, expressing, I suppose, strong religious views within a professional political setting? How had difficult, you know, was that? Was it more a value system that you're trying to bring in, sort of? Yeah, how did you find that aspect? Well, I don't have the right to impose my beliefs on anybody. Let me be clear about that. I, and equally, other people don't have the right to impose their beliefs on me. Um, I don't like no platforming. I don't like this way that we've drifted into not allowing people to express their point of view, even before you've heard it. So, for instance, Jermaine Greer and I don't always agree about a number of things, <laughs> as you might <laughs> Not be surprised to hear, uh, Greg, and you know her antecedents, uh, her Australian antecedents as well as I do. Uh, but it's not that that we disagree about it. So some of her views on on life issues, for instance, I've shared platforms with Jermaine. I like her. We, I think the feelings mutual. We express different views respectfully with one another. I think the way that she has been no platformed for expressing views uh, about transgender questions, as has J.K. Rowling. Um, as has Jenny Murray. This is ridiculous. I, I have a, a friend who, who's a journalist on, on, on the Daily Telegraph. He was invited to the University of Oxford to speak in a debate with someone with a contrary view to his on the life issues. And the meeting was scrapped when it was found, of course, that he was going to come along and put the contrary point of view. This is one of our most illustrious universities. How can that be right, but we can't even listen to what somebody else has to say? So uh, in a democracy, people have the right to vote. <laughs> and if they don't like what you stand for or believe in, they can change you, they can get somebody else. So I, I'm not about, I don't think you should conceal your beliefs, mm -hmm. but neither should you expect people to vote for you purely because of those beliefs. Um, and, I, I, and it's by your deeds that they will know you in, in the end. I, I've never had a, felt any great problem about this. I only get annoyed about it when people say, I'm not even prepared to listen to what you have to say because we know that you, you also have some religious beliefs. I told you that one of my great heroes uh, was, was William Wilberforce. Um, he would never have embarked upon his campaign to end slavery if he hadn't been motivated by his religious faith. Um, what a tragedy that would be <laughs> for millions of people to this day. Um, you think about Gladstone, uh, again, a great hero of mine, prime minister four times, born in Liverpool, and a man who changed his mind, incidentally, about issues like slavery, um, but also was heroic in speaking out against the opium trade, who said he had a mission to pacify Ireland because he saw the injustices that had taken place there. He was motivated by his religious faith. The very first Labour member of parliament, Keir Hardy, what, said, I owe my beliefs, he said, to the carpenter from Nazareth, not from Karl Marx. He was very clear about it, quote, unquote. <laughs> or you, you look at some of the great prime ministers, Harold Macmillan, who I uh, think is, is, was one of our great, greatest prime ministers, man of deep faith, uh, and many others too. You think of some of the leaders of, 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 of the Labour Party, uh, John Smith was a great leader of the Labour Party, um, sadly died before having the chance to contest a general election. Um, he was totally motivated by his faith, wrote a book about, about it. And of course, the man who then succeeded him and who won elections for the Labour Party was Tony Blair, uh, who's never made any secret of his faith. Um, although others would say, you're not allowed to do God. <laughs> but, but, yeah. God does him. I mean, he makes people tick. And actually, you'd be surprised at the number of people who certainly have a private faith and many others who, when you scratch them, you find that, that that's the thing that animates them and makes them tick. 
And if we were to say no one will be allowed to stand for parliament because they have a religious faith, then <laughs> you would lose an awful lot of people who perhaps make the most valuable <laughs> contribution uh, to our parliament. This week we had a I told you an extraordinarily important debate. I, I'm vice chairman of your party parliamentary group on Uyghurs, and we had a, this extraordinary debate about the genocide, because I think that is the right word to use, that is taking place uh, in Xinjiang. If you look at the Wednesday edition of the Times newspaper and at the letters column there, you will see a letter signed by the Church of England Bishop of Truro, lovely man, uh, Bishop Mount Stephen, Bishop of Truro, signed by an imam from the Muslim community, by a rabbi from the Jewish community, by the Catholic Bishop of Clifton. They signed it together in favour of the, the amendment I've been moving in Parliament uh, about the declaration of genocide and how it should be done. Um, don't assume always that people from different religious traditions all hate one another or can't ever agree about one another. That is a caricature. Let me end on this question by recommending uh, some books by, I think, the greatest of our religious leaders in the, in the last 50 years. And that was Rabbi Sachs, Jonathan Sachs. He was the ch chief rabbi and then came to the House of Lords. Uh, he is a man I got to know, but we, I admired him enormously. He gave one of the Roscoe lectures that I hosted in the city of Liverpool. Uh, his books in, include a defense of religious toleration. Um, and I think that learning to live together is one of the great challenges of, of the 21st century. Um, that book, uh, The Home We Build Together, uh, I think is almost like a textbook for how people of all faiths and no faith should learn to live with one another. Um, he, uh, he upheld, as I do, Article 18 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a secular declaration. But Article 18 says every human being has the right to believe, the right not to believe, and the right to change their belief. So this isn't a trivial question. After all, that declaration came out of the Holocaust. It came out of the killing of, of six million Jewish people because they were Jews, because they were different. But others died in the Holocaust too and were murdered. You think about the gypsies, the Roma, you think about disabled people, you think about homosexuals, gay people. They were different, and so they were murdered. So were dissenters like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Protestant theologian. Bonhoeffer, who stood against the Nazis and who famously said, not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. So most, so many people who privatized their faith and did nothing about it. You couldn't accuse him of that. You couldn't accuse Maximilian Kolbe, the Franciscan priest who was taken to Auschwitz for saying in, in his newspaper that he published in Poland, he said that beyond the hecatombs of the extermination camps, two irreconcilable enemies lie in the depths of every soul. He said, what point is there in all the victories on the battlefield? I mean, what point is there in all our achievements where we get elected to parliament or we have academic awards or all the prizes you can win or whatever? What point is there in this, this if we're defeated in our innermost personal selves? He was, for writing this and for facing down the Nazis, he was taken to Auschwitz, where he died because he got into the line and took the place of one of the prisoners who was about to be executed. And this man had been calling out, he said, but I'm married, I have children. He saved that man's life and gave his own in his place. So the stories, they're complicated. A lot of people did nothing, some collaborated, but others stood and said no. Jonathan Sachs, when I taught him once about the Holocaust, and perhaps only a great Jewish rabbi could say this, but I said, what do you say to people who say, well, how did God allow these terrible things to happen? And he said, David, don't ask where was God at Auschwitz. Ask where was man? Ask where was man? And I guess as a good note to finish on, if I may, Greg, this evening, I would throw that to your, back to your students, you know, ask where you will be, what will you do, what difference can you make? Doing nothing never ever changes anything. Evan Burke said, you know, all that's required for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. Find your cause, 
find something around which you can make a difference and get on with it. Don't just complain and say how terrible they all are. And, you know, what's the point? They're all as bad as one another. Well, that will be true unless you try and make a small difference. But when small stones move, landslides happen. You can uh, you can change things. Lord Alton, we we are going to finish on that. Um, wow, uh, true, you are a true inspiration. Your words uh, uh, have just inspired me, inspired everybody that, that's been been listening tonight. Um, it's funny. Just before you wrote that, I thought, what am I going to end on? And I've written down, make a difference, right? <laughs> and as soon as I wrote that down, literally. Five seconds later, you've said, make a difference. You know, um, you know, I've written down, be true to yourself. You know, I, I, I think, you know, don't all of a sudden flip-flop depending upon what everyone else thinks. Be true to yourself. Maintain your value system. You know, and, you know, I speak for myself, a Christian value system, you know, and, and, and it's so, so important. Maintain your value system. Um, be an upstander and actually, you know, and, and actually support the, your, your, your fellow humans and in, in, in those different things. Um, and everybody's got a right, you know, and to, to, to effectively all the things you talked about in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, human rights uh, throughout tonight. Um, do you have any final words or is that, uh, is, is, is that enough? I think you've probably heard more than enough from me. You get a prize if you can stop me talking, Greg. You should know that. <laughs> so, no, it's been a great pleasure to be with you. I hope that it won't be too long before I have the opportunity to come and visit Thomas and Beckett's uh, city again. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's a, I was telling uh, uh, your headmaster, Peter, before we started, that um, I was privileged to come to Canterbury during the visit of Pope John Paul II. And it was one of those days that I, I will never, ever forget because um, it was during the Falklands War and the prime minister and the political leaders were supposed to be there, but they were unable to come because it would have been seen to have turned it into a state visit of some kind. So they sent their deputies instead. So I was sent as the deputy of my, my, my party leader and watching John Paul II meeting Archbishop Ramsey and the former Archbishop, Michael Ramsey and embracing in, in Canterbury, given all the history and the story and the divisions and the, all the pain and suffering that had been caused by those things, it seemed like one of those extraordinary moments of, of healing. So, you know, I mean, after all, Beckett himself stood for religious freedom and religious liberty. Um, and we have got to find ways of enabling people to live compatibly alongside one another uh, in dignity and respect uh, and, and standing against contemporary abuses of, 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 and violence uh, of, of people purely because they are different. Um, I put a post up on my website today um, about young girls who were forcibly abducted, forcibly converted, raped, impregnated, 12 and 13 year old girls in Pakistan. Uh, Shabazz Bhatti, who was a minister in a government minister in Pakistan was murdered. No one's ever been brought to justice because he stood against those things from happening. So some people still are willing to pay the, the ultimate price for the things in which they believe. If any of your students are interested in, in learning more about people like Shabazz Bhatti or the young woman I've just been telling you about and the work that's being done on that or, or on North Korea, which is a country I visited four times and uh, we're currently doing a new inquiry into some of the depredations taking place there. Details are on my website and they'll be very welcome to have a look at that. And I think that's more than enough for me. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you so much again, David. And uh, look, uh, you, as, as you, we talked about before, you are more than welcome to, to, to visit us here at Kings in Canterbury uh, at any stage. We would love to host you. 